Hello and welcome to the Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson. The Local Leaders Podcast provides a platform for successful business owners to share their stories, their experiences, their advice, and their ideas in order to help our listeners achieve more success in their business and in their lives. Get ready. Another great show is coming up. Good afternoon to all our listeners of the Local Leaders Podcast. This is Jeff Johnson. I'm your host, and uh, we're excited to have you here listening to us uh, just a couple days after Christmas. Hope all our listeners had a great holiday, and um, we're excited today to be able to, to bring a new guest to the table all the way from Newport Beach, California. We've got Tim Campbell with Cappy's Cafe. Welcome to the show, Tim. Hey, Jeff. How are you today? I am doing fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, again, we appreciate you taking time to, to chat with us today and spend a few minutes. Let us pick your brain, uh, uh, try to pull some of that knowledge and expertise out uh, to share with our, our listeners. But, you know, to start with, why don't you give us a, a little uh, feel for Cappy's Cafe and, and kind of what it's all about? Yeah, sure, Jeff. So I bought Cappy's Cafe a little over three years ago now. Uh, Cappy's has been around, gosh, next month, it'll be around uh, 40 years. Yeah. So kind of an iconic local Newport Beach uh, uh, breakfast, lunch restaurant. Not open for dinner, but seven days a week, breakfast, lunch, uh, very high volume. Uh, I'd say probably you know 85% of our customer base is locals. And in the summertime, we certainly, with, with a lot of uh, tourists coming into town to, to hang out the beaches and uh, a lot of the tourist attractions we have, we we got a lot of tourists in the summer as well. Well, it's it's definitely. I remember, you know, when we talked before, you had mentioned uh, forty years, and and that is a uh, a long run for a restaurant. Um, so, how did you how did you come into contact with Cappy's, and kind of how did that whole sale and and process go? Yeah, so I was, uh, you know, I owned uh, my family and I. We we had a restaurant in Hawaii uh, called Uncle's Fish Market and Grill. And um, we also had a seafood company out there. And we sold the seafood company in 2015. And I decided to move back. I'm sorry, 20, uh, 2018. And we decided to move back, my wife and I and the kids, uh, to Orange County, Newport Beach. And I was looking, looking for a, a restaurant, really uh, one that was already very profitable, had a great customer base, um, great food, great uh, culture and people. But something that I think I, I could add some value to. And, you know, there was about three or four brokers here in town, restaurant brokers, um, and this one wasn't even on the market. So I just told the brokers, kind of what I just told you, I just said, you know, I want something that's profitable, something that has a lot of parking. Little did I know we'd have to have outdoor dining. Didn't know that at the time. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, had a lot of parking, well. you know, long-term lease. <laughs> um, and, you know, something, we're on uh, Pacific Coast Highway, which is, of course, the main thoroughfare. We have about 45, 50,000 cars that drive by every day. Um, and so I kind of told the, the broker what I just told you, and they, they said, I might have an opportunity for you. And, uh, they called the previous owner and sure enough, I mean, he'd owned Cappy's about four years and the prior owner had owned it for about 20 years. So the previous two owners about 24 years. So this really hasn't traded a whole lot in the last 24, 25 years. And sure enough, he was, he was willing, um, uh, to talk to me. He obviously wanted somebody that was going to take this existing, restaurant to the next level. He didn't want someone coming in with a new concept and like that, because it's, it's like I said, it's a very iconic restaurant and, and our, you know, the way my wife and I look at it, we're, we're, we're kind of holding the hands of this restaurant for a period of time and someone down the road will take over for us um, and take it to the next level as well. So it's, it's really a, a really special place, very beachy vibe. And we have people come in from all over, not only the country, but the world. We have some people in today from Mexico city. So, uh, Wow. It's, it's quite a place. It's it's a, it's a lot of fun. We play 80s music, which you're kind of the same genre that I am. And, you know, that's most great. people, even the young kids these days, love 80s music as well. Yeah, that that's awesome. Yeah, I can kind of feel it just in ha hearing you explain. I can, I can kind of get the vibe of Cappy's. And um, uh, I'm sure it's, you know, people have probably been coming there who live there for, for years and years. And, um, you know, for our listeners who are, who uh, aren't watching because we're going to have the, we'll have the website up on the screen but it's uh dot com. uh so be sure you go and check them out and uh hey speaking of that do you do you guys have um a big takeout 
uh, delivery type business? Is that part of your, your, you know, we, we model? do, um, during the pandemic, we, you know, we brought in all four, the main four. And then as we started getting busier and busier, as we started reopening last year, I decided to pair it back a little bit, you know, it just, it just became too much. Um, and, and for us, it's really serving our clientele that comes in. That's our number one priority. And the to-go business is secondary. So we still offer to-go today, but I paired it back um, just to, to the two, uh, two of the four. And we have our own as well um, online, as well as we have a lot of walk-in that get to-go because we're in an area where, again, you can kind of walk across the street and we're at the beach. Yeah. Um, so we do do some of that, but I, you know, I'd say it's pretty small, maybe, maybe you know, less than 5% of our total sales is to-go. And that's, that's kind of where I want to keep it. I don't really want to get it up in the 10 or 15%. It's just, um, you know, we, we have too many customers and we typically serve anywhere from three to 400 customers every day. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a high volume operation. And I, it just, it, especially on the weekends, you know, Saturday, Sundays are super busy and, and um, you know, it's a, it's a, it can become a big distraction for the cooks if they're having to cook, you know, 10 different to go meals. And I've got all these customers sitting, you know, waiting for their meals. So I, I, I and sometimes we turn off like last Sunday, we were so busy um the day after christmas we turned off doordash and it was um you know midway through we just couldn't handle it anymore no that's that's understandable and uh kudos to you guys for or to you for being able to recognize that and you know it's always been a pet peeve of mine to um uh, to be in a store a restaurant or to be doing any kind of business anywhere where i'm physically inside you know in the door in the face and the phone's ringing and and they're focused on answering it and taking other people's orders and and dealing with things that aren't like right there and uh so yeah. i appreciate that i'm sure you're yeah, we're, do as well yeah we're big in technology as well um I, i'm a big believer of technology and we can talk a little about that but you know, technology, even um, with the to-go apps, you know, is great. And I try and drive most of my, uh, you know, locals to go on our own app, right? So then that goes directly back to the cooks. So really the only, and we, and then on the weekends, we have to have a to-go person that that's all they're doing, answering the phones. And, you know, we, we have a lot of older customers and some of them, they don't understand the technology. They don't want to use the technology. So they want to call on the phone and speak to somebody. And, yeah. and we have that person there for those people. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's ideal. And, um, you know, like you said, you're trying to keep it down to 5% or less. And, um, you know, in, in the post COVID world, that's actually kind of different to him because, uh, so many people, you know, made that transition to curbside takeout delivery and, and a lot of them have stuck with it, you know, and kind of made that the big part of the business and, and the on-premise became secondary. So I appreciate what you're doing and I'm sure your customers who enjoy coming and, and being part of the the vibe of uh, Cappy's that, uh, you know, really enjoyed that, that you haven't gone in that direction. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, from a, I don't know, you, you've been in the, in the restaurant business before, so you've got a lot of experience. Um, had, did you start that Hawaii, the, the business in Hawaii or was that a purchase as well? No, no, actually it was a family run business. So okay. uh, my family had already, had already uh, had owned it for a number of years. I was in, the commercial real estate business for 30 years. And then um, in 2015, I moved over to Hawaii um, to run both of these, uh, both the restaurant as well as a uh, yeah. uh, seafood uh, wholesale business. Yeah, the re now, I was asking, and I should have should remembered, you said family earlier, family business. Um, but I was asking because I was, I was curious about, you know, that whole purchase process and the due diligence and things like that. Did, was there anything that, you know, once you got in there and started operating, was there anything that surprised you or caught you by surprise or anything you might've done differently here in the- uh, You know, it's a great question. It's, it's um, you, you make a lot of different decisions. Some are great, some aren't. Um, you know, I would say, um, gosh, some of the things, you know, I brought in some technology recently, um, and, you know, maybe in the last six months this past summer, where it was um, on the table um, buzzer. So essentially, uh, if you came in, you could, you could click a button and it would notify um, the waitresses and um, all the hostesses on their, uh, either on their watches, essentially. Yeah. And the idea I thought was, and that we were the first one to try this out in California. And, that, and the idea was for us, we, we have both indoors um, restaurant as well as outdoors. Cause you know, outside in California, even today, you know, heaters is, is very acceptable and having, uh, you know, whole area outside, we had 15, 20 tables on the weekends. I thought, you know, having that extra buzzer 
where if the waitress or, or hostess isn't there, would it would be helpful to bring people out. And we, you know, we tried it, but the technology, in my opinion, just isn't there yet. I think it's going to be a great function for all of us at some point, um, but it's just it's just not there yet. So I was kind of an early adopter, if you you know what I mean. And I just yeah. I just felt in, in talking to the team, we tried it for maybe about four to six weeks, and it was hard connecting the watches, and there was just some technology issues. Um, but the overall concept and idea, someone's going to nail it, and I, when they do, they will become very rich because a lot of restaurants will. We'll get this. Not that you don't want to have the touch of the waitress or the host. That's not what I'm saying at all. But you know, people are very demanding. And, you know, they drop, let's say they drop the food and whatever reason, you know, they want um, some mayonnaise and the waitress or the hostess is gone. Well, guess what? They can push that button and somebody comes over in 30 seconds and says, oh, how can I help you? Oh, I'd like to get some mayonnaise. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's that was what we were trying to do. Um, didn't work out. But again, um, you know, that's that's uh, that's OK. You're, you're, you're not going to hit, you're not going to bat a thousand as we all know. And, uh, but you know, some of the things that we did that I, I really um, um, do like, you know, we use headsets, right? So when we have to go person, rather than picking up the, the old fashioned pick up phone, we have somebody has a headset and they answer the headset and they go right to the POS. You know, we use, uh, we have Aloha. Um, so on Aloha, we have the uh, tablets um, that people use. Those work out great, right? So they can order right off the tablet. So some, if a waitress is walking by and someone says, hey, I'd like to have another Bloody Mary. We have a full bar, of course. They can enter in the tablet and it goes right to our bar. So, you know, obviously the idea is, you know, get as many drinks as we can out, right? And not there's nothing worse than a person that's finished their beer or their, their cocktail and they're they're waiting for someone to come by to order another one. And by yeah. the time they get another one, they're like, nah, I, I'm kind of done, you know? So we, yeah. try to, we try to avoid that. But, um, but that's another uh, area of technology that's really helped. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, it's great that, that so many, you know, I think COVID really, really drove the adoption of technology in the, in the restaurant space. And, um, you know, there's so many different things coming out and, and I'm in that, that business and I can't hardly keep up with it myself. Um, so it's, you know, I don't know how a restaurant owner like yourself has time to, to digest all the, all the new, new technology and new things that are coming out while trying to run the business. It's uh-huh. hard. It's hard. You know, we go to some trade shows that helps. Right. Um, yeah. You know, and then obviously some of our partners, like with Yelp, we were advertising with Yelp. They reached out to us. You know, they have a thing called Yelp waitlist. Right. Um, and we started using it. We had never really prior to COVID. We had never taken reservations. You know, we serve about one hundred and ten thousand people a year. So it's a huge volume. Uh, and we didn't take reservations historically. But I felt during COVID and even after COVID, people want to get in and out, right, with COVID. And even today, mm-hmm. right, with Omicron, people want to get in and out. They don't want to linger for a while if they can avoid it. So um, we got Yelp waitlist. And honestly, they can not only can they make reservations in advance, no, just we only have, I think we typically have like six tables every half hour. So call it 12 tables an hour that can be via reservation. But also if they're on their way um, to our restaurant, they can enter the name on the waitlist. So essentially they're on the list already before they show up. Yeah. And then we take people in the order of the list, obviously reservations first, and then whoever's on the wait list second. It's worked out great. And our customers have really liked it. And again, it's it's something we probably wouldn't have done um, prior to COVID. But COVID, you, you have to kind of look at things differently and with a new lens, right? And people look at restaurants differently now um, with COVID. You know, not only sanitation, and we still have the plastic dividers up. You know, we have a lot of booths um, in our restaurant. People love booths. And it's funny, at first when I put up the, you know, the plastic dividers in between the booths, I thought, oh, I'll probably be taking these down when COVID was over. But one thing I found out that I didn't even think about is it really uh, makes your conversation more private. Because before you were kind of back to back with somebody, yeah. you could kind of hear their conversation. But now with a big piece of plastic, you can hear it. People yeah. love that. So I never would have thought of that before this. <laughs> hey, you know, great, a great adaptation that uh, you can hang on to and uh, increase. That's customers. right satisfaction and all that good stuff and you know speaking of of the reservation piece it was making me think of the next step which you know is is out there now it's not as prominent but it's it's certainly moving forward is uh, the order ahead capability um you know get on the wait list and and by the way go ahead and place my order and uh you know with the geo fencing or whatever it is they call it they can you know as you get closer to the restaurant it'll it'll key the the kitchen to go ahead and drop the order yeah. Um, and that way, when customers get there, they grab their table and their food's out in a couple of minutes. And 
um, that really speeds up the process. But it, again, it's, you know, that's, you don't see that very often, but I think that's the next wave or at least yeah, we one, actually, one of them. Yeah, we actually, we just, it's funny you mentioned that, uh, Jeff, we just started geofencing like 30 days ago. Oh yeah. And yeah, you know, and we've been wanting to do this for a while. We finally, we finally did it and it's actually worked out really well. You know, we've gotten a lot of reservations from it. We haven't allowed the order ahead just because from our perspective, I, I don't want to have to charge the customer before they even come in and I don't feel comfortable enough, you know, a party of six ordering ahead and then they don't show up and I've got all this food and now what, yeah. you know? So that part of it, I don't like to do, but the geofencing has worked well where, you know, we can, we can, um, you know, circle certain territories around the area and, uh, and they can make reservations, right. You know, on their, their phone and, and it's worked out really well. Yeah. And, and I'm not as familiar with that technology as I should be. So uh, I'm going I'm to do a little research after the fact and, Get up to date on on that, and you know the the use case for it for for other restaurants. Because I'm glad to hear that it's working. But I hadn't thought about the order ahead and meaning pay ahead, um, which is you know maybe uncomfortable for people. So that may be an obstacle, and you certainly don't want to cook it and then not right. have it not show up. So that's right. Yeah, that's not an option. That's uh, right. <laughs> yeah, not not an option. So wow, you are uh, you know you kind of have. Uh, really worked hard from a technology perspective to take take cappies to another level. Has how about menu uh, changes and things like that? Did you stick? Have you have you stuck kind of with with what cappies uh, already had, or did, have you made changes there too? Yeah, that good question. We pretty much stuck with what the menu that we uh, inherited, but we tried. It's a really big menu and it's really big portions, breakfast and lunch. What we tried to do, you know, over a period of the last three years is really look through, which, you know, with Aloha and any POS for that matter, is easy to do, is look at, you know, over a period of time, let's say six months to a year, what are the low sellers, right? And, and like we had a liver and onions, okay? I don't like liver and onions, but I looked at the, I looked at it, and we didn't sell a lot of them. So I'm thinking to myself, let's take it off the menu. We'll still have it um, if a customer comes in and wants it for a period of time, Um but let's take it off the menu. And that's what we started doing. We evolved. We typically would do a menu twice a year. And what we would do is try and add things and take things off. So, you know, and you have to listen to your customers. I'll tell you this interesting story. I had a customer come in um, pre-COVID and said, you know, you, you've got a great menu. I love coming in here, but you're missing one item. And I said, what's that? And he says, it's, a, it's an item called a cinnamon swirl French toast. And I said, wow. And he goes, yeah, and one of your competitors up the road has it. And I said, great, I'll go check it out. And sure enough, I went up there and I'm like, wow, this is a great item. So we added it onto our menu and we brought it in, our cook learned how to do it. And it's our number two seller now. Oh, wow. So I never would have done that had I not listened to a customer. Yeah. I had another customer um, tell me maybe about three months ago, he was, he goes back and forth from Las Vegas. He has a house there. And he goes, you know, Tim, I have a breakfast place I like in Las Vegas. And they have a, what they call a, a, a country Benedict. And I said, really? I said, what's that? He says, well, rather than um, English muffins, it's biscuits. I said, that's a great idea. So guess what? Starting Friday, we're going to have that country Benedict on our menu. Holy <laughs> crap. Yeah, that, so now that, that sounds like a Southern restaurant right there, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, your customers that love your restaurant come in all the time. They can have some really great ideas and you have to listen to these folks because, you know, you can't know everything. And I know I can't, I'm never going to know everything, but they have so many great ideas. You know, some of them are harebrained. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell them this, but I don't, I would never do it. But others, like the two I just mentioned to you were great ideas. And I, you know, imagine that someone can tell you a new item in your restaurant and it's going to be your number two seller. I mean, everyone on this podcast would add that, whatever that might be in their restaurant. Exactly, exactly. That's that's great advice. So for all of our, our listeners out there, if you're not talking to and asking and learning from your customer base, you're missing an opportunity. Um, so remember that. Tim said so. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really, really awesome. Well, um, let me ask you about, I'm looking at the time, trying to be mindful there as well, but let me ask you about um, you know, the kind of the big three and how it's impacting you guys right now and, and kind of what, what you're doing to deal with it. And that is uh, staffing and uh, food shortages and costs. How, how is that, you know, how are you dealing with that over in, uh, in Newport Beach? Yeah, I, I would take, I would take um, you know, the food, our, our food costs um, 
is our number one issue. And probably everyone on this call, it's got to be your number one issue, I would think, because costs are skyrocketing. Yeah. And, you know, in California, it's a little different as well. You know, we just, in, in, we, we're going to have in, gosh, in about a week here, first of the year, um, our bacon prices out in California are going to go up 10 to 20%. Mm. Um, you know, so, which is pretty significant. And they've already gone up uh, last time I looked since earlier this year, 25%. So that's 35 to 40% increase in just bacon alone. And we sell 15,000 pounds of bacon a year. So that's huge, right? Mm. Um, and we're seeing everything go up, right? And and it's, and it, I'm not telling you anything you don't know or our listeners don't know. I mean, we see it even in our personal lives when you go to the grocery store. Mm. Or it doesn't seem like anything I want to buy, <laughs> the person's like, oh, by the way, there's a price increase. Even my coffee guy, you know, oh, by the way, in a week, the prices are going up. So that's an issue. You know, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we offset that? Well, you have to raise your prices on your menu. If you don't, you're going to go out of business, you know, period of the story. And that's not, a, that's not an option for us being here 40 years. Um, you know, now do we go crazy on price increases? No, we don't. Uh, typically, you know, depending on what it is, you know, certain things that we just don't increase like coffee, as crazy as it sounds. And I don't know, we're, I think we're all this way. You know, when you go into a restaurant and you order a coffee, whatever that price might be. Most people look at that price. They don't look at what's the cost of bacon and eggs or what's the cost of a sandwich. You kind of expect that over time to go up. Yeah. So we've had to increase pricing. And luckily I would say most of our customers, if not all of our customers don't have an issue with it. You know, their feeling is, hey Tim, as long as you give us great service, great food, great environment, right? And large portions that we can take home. So it's almost you know, in their mind, they almost kind of cut that price in half because it's a second meal yeah. day two or that night. If I raise the price 50 cents to a dollar, it's like, that's, that's not as critical to them. And I have to, and they understand it. I'm like, they understand our, our prices are going up with our vendors. We have to do it. So I would say that is by far our number one issue. Um, staffing, I would say more back of house is the issue, right? Um, cooks. So cooks, um, you know, it, it, it's tough because we've, during the pandemic, I think a number of cooks that were, let's just say furloughed during the pandemic when, when many restaurants were closed or doing to go only, they went and found another job out of the industry, right? So I think we lost as an industry, I, I, at least 10%. I, I'm sure we lost 10%, maybe 20% of our cooks in the whole industry. And those cooks aren't coming back. You know, one of our cooks, he works here now. He was here full time. He's only here Saturday, Sunday now. Well, he went to go work for uh, Marriott. And, you know, he is now doing their facilities at our Marriott, Newport Beach. Mm -hmm. I can't get him back Monday to Friday. He's gone. Now, will he work with me Saturday, Sunday? Absolutely. But that's, is I think, happened a lot in our industry that cooks that have enjoyed it and, and lost their job said, you know what, this is now maybe a time I look for something else. And that's what's happened. So that's an issue. You know, we're, we're staff fair. I'm, I, we're not overstaffed by any means, um, you know, so it's it's a, an area that is a, a challenge, right? And we've had to pay, you know, all of our back of house considerably more during and, and right now, even during the pandemic, because if we don't, guess what? They're going to go down the street and my competitor will offer them more. So I've been proactive um, and I feel good about it anyway, being proactive and really giving them a great wage um, just so there's... In my mind, I know there's no way they'll leave if they're going to stay in the in the food industry. If they're going to go somewhere else, then they might leave, but not in the food industry. Yeah, well, that, I appreciate you sharing that, and um, yeah, it's you know it's definitely an issue for the for the industry and and really for every industry. Uh, and you see that up and down the supply chain, I'm sure, uh, with ingredients and and food and pricing and you know it's all a challenge and but I yeah. agree with you I think most customers are understanding as long as they're getting that level of service that um, keeps them happy and, and keeps them coming back so that's that's all we can do um well awesome I appreciate I appreciate that once again hey what what about any, any changes um since you you acquired the, the business any changes on the marketing front uh, we talked about technology just wondered if you know what you're doing there and kind of what's working what's not uh, or are you doing any at all? Because some people said, you know, we just cut it out. Yeah, no, we, we, I'm a big believer in marketing. And I would say one of the things I would recommend for everybody on this call, it's again, you kind of learn from others and I learned this from others, but one thing that I find um, very effective and very affordable is trying to come up with a list of your customer base. And how do you do that? Well, what we do is we offer, and again, you can offer any dollar amount, but we offer a hundred dollar gift card every month. 
and we have um, we have uh, essentially a giveaway every month. All the person has to do, I, I print it up, you know, go to your local Staples and you print up a little like on a business card size and it just says, what's your name, your phone number and your email. And then that's your, now you, we've started this maybe six, eight months ago. I've got 2000 emails already. And now you can send out, you know, go to any of the, the email companies like MailChimp is what one we use, but there's lots of them out there, but we use MailChimp. And then every week, um, typically like Saturday morning, we'll send out an email to all of our customers, 2000 of them and tell them what's going on this week. For example, one that we have coming out um, this um, this week will be that we're adding all these new uh, eggs Benedict that I was just telling you about. Yeah. Um, so it's a way you can really talk to your customers um, via email. So that is very inexpensive, right? It costs you very little to do, um, but I find it very effective. So we're doing that. Um, Yelp, you know, Yelp is is um, we advertise a lot on Yelp. So um, and it's a to me, I find a lot of our new customers are coming from Yelp. And um, more so probably, I would say Yelp and Google, but I, I certainly Yelp and, and the younger generation, they definitely use Yelp. You know, they'll put in breakfast, you know, best breakfast in Newport Beach. And, you know, we come up top five. So I, I get a lot of feedback from customers. Oh, we saw you on Yelp, right? Um, so I, that's important as well. And obviously any reviews you get on Yelp, answering those reviews is critical, right? Even the negative ones. I know it's hard for all of us and you get someone give you a negative review but just answer it um, and respond to it. That's important. Um, same thing Same thing on uh, on Google. You know, Google has their own review system. I respond to every one of those uh, as the owner. I think it's critical. And um, so I would say those, those three things are important. We don't do a whole lot of print, to be honest with you. A, a little bit of print, but not much. Um, we do do a lot of, uh, in the, we, we give a lot of uh, gift cards out to the community you know, with the school functions or baseball function or whatever, I think that's important, right? Because they have the, they're all, they all have their own raffles and they're all, you know, when they raffle off, you know, they're going to see our gift card. And right. a lot of people know us, but just keeps keep keeps us um, at the front of their mind. So we, we do that for the community, which I think is important, get back to the community as well. Um, so we do that. Also Make-A-Wish. We're a big sponsor of Make-A-Wish. It's one that we've selected. What we've done is um, we have a child's menu. Um, so what we do is we donate a certain dollar amount for every child's meal sold. So, and the way we look at it, it's, it's kids giving back to kids. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea, and um, not not so hard to to kind of manage because you can you got your POS system to track it. Um, That's right. Yep. So that that makes that a little uh, easy and a, a good way to do it. So yeah, that I'm sure your community appreciates that, and I know all the kids do uh, who are uh, able to take advantage of some of those some of those benefits. It's a great cause. Um, and I uh, hope other people who are listening will maybe grab that one up. If not, you know, another local charity or uh, national charity that that's doing good work. So great ideas, man. I, you know, I haven't heard anybody talk about like the, the I just called it the fishbowl uh, deal. You know, when you talk about, yeah. you know, getting customer names and email addresses and having a little giveaway. Do you say you do that weekly or monthly? No, we do it monthly. And, you know, okay. I've heard out there in some of the different sessions I've attended, they say, if you get a customer's email, that's worth it, like just under a dollar to you. So figure it's a dollar, round it up. So imagine that I've collected 2000 or maybe a little bit more now. That's $2,000 of, you know, marketing that I've gotten for giving out, you know, 12, I've given out, let's say 12, $100 cards over a year. That's $1,200. It's yeah. so well worth it. And every, yeah. everyone's, you always see them filling it out in the restaurant and they're excited. And, and we do it once a month. Uh, every month we give out a gift card. We put it on our social media as well. That's the other thing I didn't mention to you. I mean, social media is very important. You know, Instagram, Facebook, we, we outsource that. Um, I just find there's some really great pros out there and getting food influencers into your restaurant is very critical. And typically the person that they're doing your social media, they know food influencers. Typically they're, they're a food influencer themselves. That's why they want to do it for your restaurant. Mm -hmm. But if you have the, the budget, I would highly recommend to outsource it. Um, because it's just, you know, the, the stuff that this young lady does for us, I could never do. Right. I'm just, I just don't have that skill set. And I think you have to realize what are you good at and what area should you outsource? And that's one area I'd recommend most restaurants, unless you have someone in the family that loves doing that. Great. You know, my daughter could probably do it if she didn't have a full-time job, but, yeah. um, it's, it's easiest to outsource it. And you know, the, the lady that we hired, she comes in once a month and she takes videos of, of my cooks and she'll take pictures of the food and, and she does a fantastic job. Great job. And that's, 
that's critical as well because the the young again you know the younger generation they take a picture of every meal that they eat as we know right and they post it as we know so you've got to be doing that yourselves and showing them food because that's the first thing they're going to do they're going to look at your yelp reviews and then they're going to come right to your social media and look at your food pictures and if you got no food pictures or it looks terrible they're not coming right you just lost them you just lost a bunch of kids that that you know could be very profitable for your business absolutely and that's that's great advice too and you know, being sure that you got high quality um, photographs and high quality video and uh, heck, today's phones can give you that. You know, sometimes they it's can. a matter of, of lighting and making sure that you've got kind of the setup down. And sounds like that's right. She, sounds like she's got it got it going on. And, um, you know, you guys are rocking and rolling, man. So, you know, as we I just looked at the clock, so we're right at 30 minutes. Let me just ask you this to, to kind of wrap it up. Um, yeah. Any. Uh, major plans. I think we talked about the possibility of uh, maybe another location down the road. Um, kind of what's what, what's the future look like? Yeah, I, good question. I I, uh, I definitely want to uh, open another Cappies. I'm looking, you know, in Orange County, um, close to the water. So I haven't picked out an exact location yet, but it's definitely in the plans for that. Um, I've got another restaurant I'm, I'm potentially looking to buy, um, a breakfast, lunch as well. I really want to stay in that space. I, I I think, you know, those, if you're in, let's say the, let's just say, say you sell pizzas. I, I think it's hard to try and all of a sudden do something different because you're so used to selling pizzas and your mindset's yeah. selling pizzas. And my, for me, it's breakfast, lunch. That's what I've done well, you know, with a full, full bar, of course, but to try and do dinner now, it's just, it's just a different type of customer. Right. And I, for us, we really want to stay in the breakfast, lunch space and continue to buy, um, uh, some of our comp- top-notch competitors that I see that they're a competitor, they're doing great, but let's just say they want to sell out. They've been in the business for 20, 30, 40 years, and they want to move on and retire. Those are the kind of people we want to try and buy. And just acquire more of those, and, and at the same time, not get crazy on expansion, opening up um, you know new locations for Cappies, but when we see the right location, to execute it. And that's another thing I would, re- I would certainly, the best advice I can give your customer base is, don't just expand to expand and say, hey, yeah, I got I got my second location. Isn't that great? Because guess what? You probably already have an A location. You're making great money in your A. But if you open a C location, guess what? It's going to suck all the money from that A location to your C location. Wait until you find that other B plus, A minus, or even A plus location, and then pull the trigger. Because I see that happening so many times where people expand. And even you see that in the big brands. They'll expand. The, I'm sure you've seen it in your neighborhood. And you're like, why did this big brand go here? That's a terrible location, right? Mm-hmm. Got to wait, wait, be patient, wait till you get that great location. Because guess what? Even in the food service business, location is critical, right? We have a great location on PCH, as I told you earlier. Yep. That's what I want to try and do when I expand is find another great location. So you have two A's because two A's, you're going to be very successful versus if you have an A and a C, you're going to say to yourself, why did I open that second location? It's killing yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, you're just, you're just working harder and making less. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and and for all of our listeners out there, and for for everyone else included, we none of us want to do that. We want to we want to get paid for our work and uh, work harder and smarter and make more money. So uh, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming on uh, the podcast today, Tim, and, and sharing all that. You re- you really said a lot in a, a short period of time, and I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, happy holidays and happy new year. Hey, happy holidays. Happy new year to you as well. And to all our listeners uh, for the Local Leaders Podcast, we thank you for joining us for another great episode. Uh, if you're in the Newport Beach area uh, and it, you know, on a normal basis, make sure you're, you visited Cappy's Cafe. And if you have not, shame on you. Get down there, uh, have breakfast or lunch with these guys, have a cocktail. Uh, after lunch and uh, you know check them out on the website order online if you need to call them they'll take your order uh, old-fashioned way as well Uh, and just continue to support cappies and again tim thanks for being on and and thank you our listeners for listening in today to another episode of local leaders podcast Um, we're going to sign off for today but i look forward to seeing you next time